Row, Begley, Harding, Johnson, Here. Melton, Here. Palermo. Here. Mr. President. Thanks, and everybody, please have a seat. Um, you know, we learned some news this morning that Dr. Ron Roskins passed away this morning. He was the longest serving uh, president for the University of Nebraska systems. He started as chancellor at, at UNO, but a little bit that a lot of you may not know is that Dr. Roskins also served for 21 years as the chair of our Omaha Douglas County Building Commission. So this building that you're sitting in now, as well as the courthouse, um, Dr. Roskin sat over and made sure that these buildings continue to be maintained for, for the public. It was quite a job and he took it very seriously. I was fortunate to have sat on the um, building commission with him for about six years. And you know, he came to every meeting. I mean, there were times he needed a walker, but he was making sure that he was getting to those meetings until he honestly couldn't um, get down here anymore. But he truly cared um, about this community, he cared about the University of Nebraska, and he helped so many students and people in this community throughout his life. And I think it's, um, he was also very patriotic. You know, he worked with George H.W. Bush. Um, one of the things he loved were the letters that they used to exchange. And he said that the, there's a lost art in letter writing that um, I think Dr. Roskins and President Bush continued to share that many of us don't because we're texting on our phones and it's really not the same. Um, but I think it's probably appropriate that he did pass away on Nebraska's, is this our birthday, statehood day, um, March 1st. He loved this state and he loved our country and Dr. Roskins is gonna be truly, truly missed and, and did a lot, so thank you. Thank you, a notable public servant for sure and we thought about him this morning as we met in the Roskins room downstairs. Yeah. Madam Clerk. An affidavit of publication is on file for the pre-council and city council meeting, and a current copy of the Open Meeting Act is posted in a white binder on the east wall of legislative chambers. Good afternoon and welcome to the Omaha City Council. We look forward to hearing your testimony today on our many items. I would encourage you to turn your cell phones off or at least turn them to vibrate. First, we do have a presentation and a proclamation that I will read, brought to our attention by the Leadership Omaha class of 44 and uh, Keith Station who's here to receive it. Keith, if you wanna come down or, and your group. I'm honored to read it as a, um, someone who works in healthcare and appreciate you all bringing the attention of Healthcare Workers Week um, to the city council. And it goes like this. Whereas healthcare professionals have carried a great responsibility for the past two years, providing care for individuals and families impacted by COVID-19, consistently serving our community with their expertise and unwavering compassion. And whereas we recognize healthcare workers to include doctors, nurses, EMS workers, first responders, pharmacists, lab technicians, mental health professionals, clinical staff, and countless other individuals serving in medical offices and hospitals throughout our city. And whereas it is difficult to comprehend the work, strain, and sacrifice healthcare workers face every day, and, health, and Healthcare Workers Appreciation Week is meant to show our gratitude to and recognition, recognition of all who work in our healthcare and medical system, ensuring the health and safety of our communities. And whereas the City Council of the City of Omaha joins the Omaha Douglas County community in showing appreciation and kindness to all the real life heroes who serve in bringing health services and support to those we love every day, changing lives for the better before and during the pandemic. And whereas Leadership Omaha Class 44 acknowledges and celebrates the commitment of healthcare workers and asks individuals and businesses throughout the city to share their gratitude on social media this week with the hashtag light, light white for healthcare, display white ribbons in windows and yards, light up buildings in white, conduct an act of kindness, or simply just say thank you to a healthcare worker. Now therefore, we the City Council of Omaha do hereby proclaim 
the week of February 28th through March 4th, 2022, as Healthcare Workers Appreciation Week. Thanks for your work on this. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd recognize you for some comments if you'd like. Thank you. Uh, wow, what an honor. Key Station, Deputy Chief of Staff, Omaha Mayor's Office, 1819 Farnham, uh, President Festison, members of council, thank you so much for uh, this opportunity to, to uh, express our gratitude for healthcare workers. Um, as you read, uh, President Festison, we, we are acknowledging healthcare workers in our community, not just physicians, not just nurses and docs, but also people who are first responders and people who work the front desks and work security and, and everyone who works to support the sector. We want to acknowledge and thank them. Uh, we want to keep them encouraged. We want to make sure if, if we can uh, prevent maybe one person from leaving the industry or, or to stay encouraged or to stay on a shift, we, we've, we've done our job. So I have a few uh, comments I wrote down so I can stay on, on topic here. Um, I'm here in my professional capacity, but also as a member of the community. Um, I'd like to thank Mayor Stothert, uh, a former critical care nurse, by the way, as well as the Douglas County Board of Commissioners uh, who offered a resolution acknowledging and thanking healthcare workers. Um, again, as you mentioned, uh, President Festus, I'm a member of, of Leadership Omaha, uh, the class of 44, which is the best class ever. Um, I was going to ask about that. It, 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 <laughs> we are. We are. Uh, President Festus is an alum of uh, Leadership Omaha. Um, I'm a, co a member of the a cohort of 49, and I'm joined by my small group team members. Um, and and, and uh, Nicole and Lindsay are here, but the full group is Lindsay Borgeson, a senior vice president at Core Bank. Um, Nicole Seckman Gillett, partner at Abrahams, Caswell, and Casman. Did I get it right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Megan Connolly, who's the vice president of community pediatrics and child health at Children's Hospital, not present. Uh, Joe Marinkovich, who's the director of programming for Football for the World. Jordan Hassan, assistant general counsel at the Schooler Company. And Jessica Strollman, community relations coordinator at Farm Credit Services of America. So we, we, the task at hand was to set out to uh, develop a project that would make an impact in the city. And, and one that was uh, worthy of our collective efforts to, to do good um, in the name of Leadership Omaha. Uh, what better way to make uh, an impact than by acknowledging heroes? And we appreciate that, that corporations and, and organizations in town have called healthcare workers heroes. Uh, we'd, we'd like to acknowledge the many healthcare organizations that have stepped up to join this campaign. Too many to, to list, but I, we'd, we'd like to maybe say a few. And we'd like to thank the many students, um, elementary school students, and maybe even beyond elementary who have, who have uh, written uh, thank you notes. Uh, we have a ton of them that we will be delivering to healthcare workers throughout our community. Um, so what we'd like to do is, is encourage you all, uh, the council and, and members present, and anyone who's listening and watching, to uh, take some time to thank your favorite healthcare worker. I'm, I'm sure that some of you have a relative, or maybe you're, you're, you yourself, or, um, one of your children or, or a parent uh, as a healthcare worker, thank them uh, with a cup of coffee, with a phone call, with a hug, uh, or just a, a, a thank you. Uh, again, uh, please wear white on March 4th. If you, if you notice the hashtag is light, white for health, the number four healthcare. And on March 4th, which is Friday of this week, it all culminates in, in everyone wearing white, wearing a, a white ribbon, if you would, uh, buildings lighting up white, and also, um, social media posts with the hashtag, again, light white for healthcare. So to, um, so, so all that, with all that said, we, we wanna say thank you to healthcare heroes. We, we honor you, uh, we salute you, and we appreciate your service to our communities locally and, and beyond. So I'd uh, invite my team members to say a few words if you'd like. Keith, you did a great job, okay. I have nothing to add. <laughs> I would just echo, echo our appreciation for being here. Yes. Um, the last two years have been challenging for those in the industry, and we just think this is a great time to return to a state of gratitude. So thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and we'd like to acknowledge our, our media partners who have covered this as well, some of the television outlets, um, Nebraska Sunrise News is here, and, and some others. Uh, so thank you for the media coverage, and, and um, please tell someone and, and spread the campaign.
Okay, Madam Clerk. All right, item six, a resolution to approve the preliminary plat for Evergreen, located southeast of 168th and Military Road. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. Public hearing and vote on number six is today. Proponents, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Brent Beller, 1140. And actually, I'm here to request a layover for 30 days on this item, if that's acceptable. And uh, you want to give us a, your rationale or what? Uh, the request? Part of the rationale, as I understand it, I'm actually covering this for a partner of mine that is uh, ill at the moment. Uh, but I understand that there is some contract negotiation going on and, and how the contract's going to work out as far as the acquisition of the property. So we need an additional 30 days to kind of determine the feasibility for it. Gotcha. I suspect we'll do that and continue the public hearing at your request, but I, because it is public hearing, I'll just ask if there's any other uh, proponents that want to speak here today. Seeing none, any opponents? I'll not close public hearing, and Ms. Melton, you're recognized. Hold on. How much time would you like? I'll do a motion to lay it over, but I need to know how much time uh, you like. April 5th sounds like a great date. Uh, then <laughs> April, I will move to lay it over to April 5th. Thank you. And continue the public hearing. Second. Roll call. Roe. Yep. Bagley. Aye. Harding. Yes. Johnson. Yes. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed seven to zero. Item seven, a resolution to approve the preliminary plat for Stratford West, located southwest of 171st Street, Military Road, Planning Board and Planning Department, recommend approval. Public hearing and vote on number seven is today. Proponents, please. Good afternoon, Mr. President and members of the council. Uh, my name is Mark Johnson. My address is 11440 West Center Road. Appearing today on behalf of the applicant Celebrity Homes and just here to answer any questions. Thank you. Any other proponents on number seven? Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearings closed. Roll call. Roe, yes. Bagley, Aye. Harding, yes. Johnson, yes. Melton, yes. Palermo. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Item seven is approved, seven to zero. One public hearing can be held for items eight through ten for MH Landing, located northeast of 72nd and Grover Streets. Planning Board and Planning Department recommend approval. Item eight, a resolution to approve the final plat. Item nine, a resolution to approve the subdivision agreement. Item 10, a resolution to approve the MH Landing 71st and Haskell Tax Increment Financing Redevelopment Project Plan and amount up to $2 million. Public hearing and vote on numbers 8, 9, and 10 are today. As the clerk noted, we'll take these hearings together, but we'll have separate votes on these items. So we'll start with proponents, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Brent Beller, 1140 West Center Road. On the behalf of the applicant, MH Ozone uh, LLC. With me today is Randy Kushak with Lampert Nearson, the project engineer. Um, just to kind of re remind folks where we are. So this is the former Coco Keys development. Um, obviously an important intersection, an important area of our city. Uh, we have I-80 just to the south of us, Grover Street, uh, Haskell on the north, 72nd Street going north and, uh, north and south. Um, currently this project is in the phase of being demolished. So what's being proposed here is six new lots. Um, these lots are effectively, there's gonna be a large lot to the west. This is gonna be what's called lot six. This will be hopefully maybe a future multifamily type development. On the east side, lots one, uh, two, and th one, one, two, and three are all retail type uses. Um, lot four is a hotel, which is what we're gonna talk about here in a moment for a future TIF. And then lot five will be a, an office building, which will also, we're, at, we're actually in the process of applying for additional TIF uh, for this project. So. That is the plat. Uh, the only difference between the, this final plat and the preliminary plat that was before you back in December is the name. Uh, it used to be called Maverick Landing, now it is MH Landing. We didn't want any confusion with our friends at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. So we changed that and we appreciate staff uh, jumping on board uh, to make those changes. Um, with respect to the TIF, and I'm not sure, Don, if it, it's okay if I go forward on this, I'll just go ahead and talk about it. Um, on lot four, what's being proposed is an 85 room uh, Fairfield Inn and Suites. Total project cost for this is about 11.8 million. We're obviously requesting $2 million uh, in TIF. One of the things that I'll highlight, um, there's, a, there's a good amount of public improvements and site work that go into this project, probably about $400,000 of true public infrastructure. A portion of that is the reinstallation of 70th Street right here. Uh, in addition to the to the paving, you have storm, you have utilities, all that good stuff that goes into uh, reinstalling a public right of way right there. Um, but all told, 25 new jobs, 50 new construction jobs. Uh, return on investment with TIF is about 5%. Without TIF, it's about 0.6%. Um, so those numbers all kind of line up with what we traditionally like to see as far as TIF. 
Um, so it's a good project. I think this project or this particular lot will be the catalyst for everything else when you bring that hotel user. Uh, next online will be that office and then hopefully the retail follows suit. So um, a nice reuse of reuse of this particular piece of property. Obviously the Cocoa Keys Ramada has kind of run its course as far as a useful product. So this is, you know, it's good use tip to offset some of these true public infrastructure expenses. Um, last but not least, I, I know there's been a little correspondence maybe with Mr. Begley about um, the timing of all this, and I just wanted to make sure that we were on record publicly to say um, we actually appreciate staff, public works, and planning department's um, efforts to really kind of expedite this project. Um, we submitted back in September, and here we are in March. I mean, that's, that's seven months to get a final plat of this magnitude through all the various departments, all the hearings. Um, so thank you, and we just want to make sure that we're on record saying that I don't think there was any slowness or anything like that. I think our, our city staff is fabulous at what they do. So with that, uh, I'm here for any questions. And demolition already underway, as I've, as I've noticed. I'm sorry. Right. And demolition already underway, right? Demolition has started. We're about 60% of the way done. Yeah, good. Any other proponents today? Good afternoon, Don Seaton, Omaha City Planning, 1819 Farnham. And um, it, actually, it's, everything's been covered pretty nicely, I think. I'll just kind of underscore a couple of things. Uh, one is that this project does come with substantial demolition costs, a very large existing building that's being demolished. I also want to emphasize that with the replat, it is lot four only that is a, the part of this TIP application. Um, and then let you know that's been approved by the City Planning Board and uh, endorsed by the TIP Committee and uh, we ask for your support. Show you a couple of pictures of the proposed Fairfield as well. Thank you. Thank you. Other proponents on eight, nine, and 10 today? Seeing none, any opponents? Larry Store, 5015 Lafayette Avenue, Omaha, 68132. I might read just a little bit here and I'll give you a copy. This is at another source, not just me, but this is printed in the Omaha Reader Magazine. Uh, November of 2021, I've talked about TIF a number of times. And some of the words I've used have been called in, in uh, insincere, maybe even false. But I'd like to read something here that implies that the tax benefits or tax inequalities of TIF has not really been fully explained before the public at this podium. Because the open meetings law interpretation is that we can't have two-way conversations. I cannot ask you. You can ask me or tell me that I can ask you, but I cannot ask you those questions. Uh, let me read a sentence here. Maybe they left something out, but something needs to be explained. How it works in Omaha. The city freezes the current property tax valuations, plural. It doesn't say the current tax property value of the developer. It doesn't say of the owner. But then the difference is made up by who? must be the other property owners in the area over that 15 years, if it's blighted. But maybe the extreme blighted designation comes out. Uh, but cities like Chicago, teachers have been striking in part over the overuse of TIF, which cuts off public school fi primary financing. There's the trick in Omaha. Yeah, Douglas County Board of Equalization sets tax uh, property values. But oh no, they don't raise your taxes. Omaha Public Schools does, or Learning Community Council does. Everybody wants to shift the blame and responsibility. But I would like this body to declare once and for all Sometimes you say the owner, sometimes you say the developer. First of all, how many developers do we have local? 
How many developers that are not local get TIF? How did they acquire the property? Are they getting the break or is an owner of the property getting a break? Those are things that are never discussed and they should be. And I do agree with North Omaha residents that once again, here we have 72nd Street and Haskell getting a big break and nothing in North Omaha. Yeah, we do have some development up there and some new apartments and things, but my God, we're giving away a lot of money and raising taxes and this morning, they talked about the nationwide average retail value of a house determining what Omaha's housing values are and selling prices. Excuse me, when it keeps going up like that, if they base it on the nationwide average price or the price that somebody from Colorado paid after selling a million dollar house and coming into Omaha and bought a $200,000 house, put a few things into it and sold it for 400,000. But they didn't give me a break. My values are based on that house next door that somebody else bought and turned and flipped. Uh, and some of my neighbors, including me, haven't filed uh, permits for all of the improvements that have been made on some properties. So a lot of those people aren't paying higher taxes because of improvements. They're paying higher taxes because of TIF. Thank you. Thank you. Any other opponents to 8, 9, and 10 today? See none. Public hearings closed. Mr. Bagley, you're recognized. Thanks, Mr. President. Um, Brett, if you got a second. I know on, on that location there for years going back, and I think my colleague, Councilman Palermo, worked at that location at one time when you were rolling as a teenager, didn't you? At the Holiday Inn there were back in political history in Omaha when I was a kid I would go there with my parents on election night when my friends on the council's party were crushing us or we were crushing them on one different time or another but good memories of that location I'm glad to see that there's a lot of good plans in there with multifamily and retail and a hotel going in amongst other things uh, right with a great access to I-80 and 72nd Street so I appreciate the work you put in working with the city on that, and I think that's going to be a, a great project when it's completed. A lot of good jobs with it, and I'll look forward to it when it gets completed. Thanks. Thank you. Councilman Plamer just said it's the best job he's ever had, so I'm not sure what that says about being on the city council. <laughs> <laughs> no for the lights. Is there a motion? I'll make a motion to, um, to approve. On, on item 8? Motion or second on item eight, roll call. Rowe, yes. Bagley, Aye. Harding, yes. Johnson, yes. Melton, yes. Palermo, yes. Mr. President. Yes. Item eight is approved seven to zero. Is there a motion on number nine? Make a motion to accept number nine. Roll call. Rowe, yes. Bagley, Aye. Harding, yes. Johnson, yes. Melton, yes. Palermo, yes. Mr. President. Yes. Item nine is approved seven to zero. And number 10. Roll call. Rowe, yes. Bagley, Aye. Harding, yes. Johnson, yes. Melton, yes. Palermo, yes. Mr. President. Yes. Item 10 is approved, 7 to 0. Thank you. Item 11, a resolution to approve the Abbott Drive Industrial Building Tax Increment Financing Redevelopment Project Plan located at 5906 Abbott Drive in an amount up to $3,875,000. Public hearing and vote on number 11 is today, Mr. Seaton. Uh, yes, uh, Don Seaton, Omaha City Planning, 1819 Farnham. Uh, this project site near the airport um, is just east of Lindbergh Drive, located between Abbott Drive and Stores Expressway. It's this roughly triangular shaped parcel. It's long been vacant, about 1.9 acres. Uh, the proposal is for a uh, warehouse, warehousing distribution facility of about 150,000 square feet along a major gateway into the city, so there'll be some berming and landscaping to help screen the back of the building. The um, parking on site includes 148 stalls, room for about 50 trailers, developers F&J Enterprises, Frank Krejci uh, mm -hmm. is the manager. Total project cost is about 21 million. 
They're requesting $3,875,000 in TIF support. Here's an elevation of the building. That's a little big. Let me see if I can zoom out a little. It'll be a uh, modern contemporary warehousing distribution building. Um, project meets the criteria of the TIF uh, program. It's an appropriate land use for the area, and we ask for your approval. Thank you. Any other proponents today on number 11? Uh, Mr. President, members of the Omaha City Council, my name is Jim Lang. I'm an attorney at 8526F Street here. Um, I represent uh, the uh, developer owner of this property, Frank Krejci, F and J Enterprises. I think this is a really an exciting project for this particular area of the city. Uh, this is a 150,000 square foot uh, state-of-the-art warehouse coming in. And uh, there hasn't, we're really kind of pioneering here, there hasn't been a lot of this type of development near the airport. And it's really important for the city of Omaha and the airport area to have this type of development. When you fly into other airports throughout the country, you fly down, you look down, and you see all the industrial areas, you see the warehouses. You get to fly into Omaha, you see some vacant land around the airport. So I think it's very important that we develop the, the airport area, and this will be a, a, a state-of-the-art type of a, of a structure. This will also be a catalyst once this happens for other properties in the airport area to continue to develop and develop that area around the airport, which is really important for this city. Uh, job creation uh, from this, there'll be 60 jobs approximately during construction. Afterwards, about 35 jobs. Uh, and as far as the, the TIF amount here, there's a, a large amount of funds that go into the soils here. They're, the soils here uh, require a lot of uh, uh, development, a lot of cost, and uh, that's part of the reason for the uh, increase in the TIF. And also, since we're pioneering here, the, the, the cost of the development itself is uh, fairly high compared to the return on the investment for which you can get on a square footage basis. So we feel this is a real catalyst for this area, really important for the city, really important for the airport. So we ask for your uh, support of this particular project. Uh, the planning staff and the uh, planning board has recommended approval of this. So if you have any questions, I have Larry Smith here, the architect, and uh, Dennis Serco, the real estate person in charge. Happy to answer those for you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other proponents on number 11? Luis Jimenez, 2709 Dewey Avenue. I just want to point out what was said that this is an appropriate use of the area near the airport. Um, I, don't, I don't have any reason to doubt that. I do want to, though, clarify that the area there you know, could use development like this warehouse, but it, around the airport, there's also corrections, and that, that would also be an appropriate use uh, for the area, to be clear. Thank you. Thanks. Any other proponents? Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearings closed. Ms. Johnson, you're recognized. Yes, Mr. Hi, just oh. wanted to tell you thank you um, for the investment, mm -hmm. the job opportunities, as well as the con um, construction opportunities. Um, as you mentioned earlier, this is going to be certainly a welcome addition along the airport. And I'd like to um, personally thank you again, along with City Council here, about the investment in Omaha as a whole. I'm going to go ahead and uh, make the motion to approve. All right. I, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Krejci has owned this property for about 30 years, too. So it's uh, <laughs> it's about time something happens. This one seems a little bit easier than Crossroads, though. Uh, much <laughs> easier. <laughs> There's a motion and a second. No further Thank lights. You. Roll call. Roe. Bagley. Aye. Harding. Yes. Johnson. Yes. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Item 11 is approved 7 to 0. Item 12, a resolution to approve the Skylark Development <coughs> Tax Income Financing Redevelopment Project Plan located at 101, 115, and 117 South 38th Avenue 
in an amount up to three million eight hundred thousand dollars is communications in opposition sees an amendment requested by the law department this item was laid over from our january 11th meeting at the developers request today is the public hearing and votes proponents please mr seat <clears throat> yes good afternoon don seaton omaha city planning uh projects located at 38th and dodge it's on uh, three parcels that are occupied by four buildings if you look at the existing site the dodge this is the project site looking south and the three buildings are historic buildings i thought we should maybe take a look at those as well so those are the three buildings uh, proposed as a new apartment building about five or six stories approximately 132 apartment units 110 parking spaces 10 of the units will be um, a little lower rental rate intended to serve as affordable units project adds density near the orbit line uh, developer of skylark development llc brett west is the manager total project investment is about 28 million dollars they're asking for 3.8 million in tiff support project complies with the master plan <coughs> excuse me and we ask for your approval thank you other proponents, please. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, ben Pick, 10250 Regency Circle. Uh, I'm here on, be uh, on behalf of the development team along with other members of the developers. Um, we're here to, to ask that the City Council approve the application. Um, just a couple of quick additions to what was said previously. Um, this is a, a seven-story building. There is one uh, below grade parking structure with about 110 parking stalls. Uh, part of the reason for the uh, previous overlay request uh, was to provide the development team some additional time to analyze the budget as costs are increasing weekly and monthly. Um, the, the, we wanted to reconvene and analyze the, the budget for this project. Um, there have been some increases in costs, but we are keeping the TIF request at the same amount as 3.8 million. And um, we do ask that the City Council approve the application and are here to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Other proponents, please. Good afternoon. Stephen Sykes, 1023 North 64th Street, uh, member of the development team. Um, just here to answer any questions with regard to the project or the request today. Thank you. Stephen, you might, if, I think you're requesting uh, Amendment C, right? Do we want to just talk about what that does? You bet. Um, for illustration, I can show. This is the orientation of the building as it was presented previously and initially. Uh, you'll note there that the courtyard that I show you on this image was facing east. And what we've done is we've rotated the, the building 180 degrees um, to, now, to now show the courtyard facing west. And so that's 38th Avenue here. And so what we're, what we're really pleased about is that the orientation of the courtyard um, to the pedestrian traffic on 38th Avenue seems to be a significant improvement for the neighborhood and, uh, and to some degree um, reminds us of some of the historic apartment buildings that you see if you walk the Blackstone neighborhood. Uh, so we hope that that's an improvement that's, that's uh, I guess, recognized or agreed, agreed upon by the group. Um, I did have a chance to speak with the president of the Blackstone Neighborhood Association uh, their executive committee is tonight. They'll be presenting these same changes to the design. And um, it sounds like there's no anticipation of any concern from their neighborhood association. And we'll continue to provide updates to them and the public as we go. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Other proponents today? Seeing none, any opponents? Larry Storer, 5015 Lafayette Avenue, Omaha, 68132. To finish up on the other article that was in uh, the magazine I gave to you, I'd like to read a few other things. Uh, information per the reader, they seem to get a lot of information that we citizens do not. I'd Sorry, like to know, know how. I know you've made some remarks about TIF today already. I'd encourage you to keep this one directed towards um, the Skylark development that is this item number 12. 
position not on affordable housing, et cetera. There's an new, affordable housing. New apartments. There's an affordable housing. Are they not uh, getting Jeff? Component to it. Yes, there is. Okay. So I'd encourage you to direct the project directly. May I continue or am I out of order? If you if you address the project we're talking about on number 12, you're in order. I'm talking about 38th and Dodge area. Okay, go okay. for it. Yeah, 115 or whatever. Another example of things south of Dodge, not north of Dodge, and in an area that I don't think is very blighted. I used to live in that area when I was going to college, and it still doesn't look blighted. But there's little things popping up all over that I guess I don't uh, don't hear in a public newspapers or TIF as to when they declared that blighted. But anyway, to continue on with the article, uh, it also quotes Miss Erin Factinger of Together, a local nonprofit and advocate for affordable housing. She's not real happy with the history of TIF in Omaha either in regards to affordable housing. Now, how is this new complex going to be affordable under that definition? This article implies that Omaha does not have a definition of what is affordable. The federal government says not more than 30% of your income. Uh, I won't read the whole article because it's negative, and it does quote the city council president. Uh, in there, President Pete Festerson said TIF is a small part of the solution. He's trying to leverage $20 million in federal COVID-19 relief money instead of developers' money. I don't know. Uh, by the way, I think I drove by the Leavenworth Cafe, and that's now part of Together, Inc. I don't know that that area was ever severely blighted either. So. Just a little more transparency from our people in regards to TIF. Thank you. Thank you. Any other opponents? Seeing none, pub. Oh, is there an opponent? Please come down. Good afternoon. Tim Kalkowski, 1502 South 10th Street. Um, I'm here just in opposition to this. Uh, that gentleman spoke to it also. Um, I'm also here because my 90-year-old father cannot be here today. He lives at 122 South 39th Street. Um, I've spoken about this before in front of this chamber, and it was a nice little neighborhood, scruffy neighborhood, when they moved in 18 years ago. You cannot find parking anywhere there now with all the development that's gone along on Farnham Street. This, uh, by their own admission, does already not have enough parking spaces. The developers have not put in enough parking spaces to even accommodate the people who are going to be living there. I mean, I think it was out of 130, there's 111 parking spaces, something like that. Um, then they're gonna have commercial uses. Where do these people park? We can't go visit my mom and dad without walking blocks and blocks and blocks away now for where they live. And then we're gonna give them 38 or $3.8 million to do this too. I understand life goes on. I know I'm talking, <laughs> um, not to the wall, but almost, because development goes before anything else does. I just, I don't think that it's been well thought out, well planned. The developers are going to make money over it, hand over fist. I don't see why we have to give them $3.8 million more. Um, I live in a building that got TIF financing. We now pay those taxes. The developer doesn't pay them. So I just, I find that a little bit odd and antithetical to the whole idea. Like, make yourself a development, make a good profit on it, but don't make the people who are then going to be there pay your taxes because you didn't want to. Thank you. Thank you. Any other opponents to that? Luis Jimenez, 2709 Dewey Avenue. Um, I'm a, uh, an opponent, and the uh, reason being is that I don't think that this really, well, one particular thing that was presented was the orbit um, use to this program. I don't, I'm not convinced that somehow this development is going to increase ridership on the <coughs> orbit line. Now, there's a lot of uh, units, so if 
you're going to increase the percentage. Maybe that's something, but I don't think there's going to be a significant, well, I'm not convinced, uh, use of the Obert because of this development. Um, if that's something the developer wants to do, I hope they're, they're serious about it. Um, I recently learned about triple ends, where there's in this like a bill assessment, basically money that's required to be paid. Um, and uh, you know that that's that's important for working people and, and uh, residents here that their bills remain low so that they can uh, afford a living. This discussion about affordable living, I think, is insincere. Uh, maybe because of um, how those numbers are extrapolated, um, but the the discussion about affordable housing and uh, fees, underlaying fees, that, that's a serious matter. And I hope that the developers are serious about increasing um, ridership on the overbit line because I don't think that's gonna happen just because you're gonna have this big development, a lot of people moving in. Doesn't work like that, I don't think. Thank you. Thank you. Any other opponents today? Seeing none, public hearings closed. Mr. Bagel, you're recognized. Thanks, Mr. President. Stephen, are you back there? Thanks. Um, I appreciate, so we talked about this. We met early on, and I talked to the folks in the BID and Blackstone, and also the Blackstone Neighborhood Association. You, you had, in my request, um, after you had the layover, you reach out to Mark and had a conversation with Mark, I think it's, is it Mazur? I'm probably Mazur. pronouncing that wrong. Mark Mazur, that's correct. Um, so I had a couple conversations with him on behalf of his neighborhood association. And can you just briefly tell me about how your conversation went with him yesterday when he asked you about the delay and the changes that you made here that are presented today? Sure. Um, we, we had a conversation, my, my development partner, Josh Hannum, who's here with us as, as well, uh, got on a Zoom call with Mark on Sunday afternoon about 5 p.m. and uh, presented a, a few of these images uh, principally, our, our interest was in explaining uh, to the president of the Neighborhood Association the difference between the layout that we discussed here a moment ago. So again, initially, here's what we presented. Wanted to make sure that this was identified as essentially the, the what we would say one of two significant updates, orientation being one, and then the adjustment to the number of parking stalls being the second one. Um, and then with regard to the question about the conversations that we had in the uh, last six weeks since we were here, or last about four weeks since we were here. Um, you know, primarily those conversations with the development team and with general contractors were around pricing, as has been noted. Uh, pricing for construction projects of this kind has increased significantly, and uh, we needed to spend some more time to vet those bids and understand if we could build this project uh, feasibly. Um, so those were the those were the primary uh, points of our conversation. Uh, Mr. Mazur explained that um, he did not anticipate that the board, or excuse me, that the neighborhood association was going to take a position different than the one they'd already taken, which was neutral, um, neither for nor against, is how they've discussed it and determined that their their position is going to remain. And so uh, that was also a product of our conversation. Okay, and I I I also had a couple conversation with Mark. I did several weeks ago, and also recently. And again, I appreciate you taking the time, you and Joshua reaching out to him. And after you guys talked to him, when I circled back to him, he said that, as you indicated, they're having a meeting, is it tonight or tomorrow night? Tonight for the executive committee. Okay. And then, and then, and then I offered to, to, excuse me, offered to visit with the broader membership on Thursday if they would like to do that. Right. And, and he indicated to me that unless I heard from him that they were remaining neutral on that, on their um, not against or for it. So the other thing you had talked about was, is it Johnson deconstruction, deconstruct? Tell us a little bit about what th your plans are for what they're gonna do to these three buildings if this is approved today. 
Sure, I'd be glad to. And if, if you'd allow me to bring uh, my partner Josh up to yeah. the podium, I think Josh could speak. He's done him. taking the Christmas lights down when I caught yeah. him the other day. So. Josh Hannum, 1410 North Saddle Creek Road, uh, partner in the development. Yeah, I'll talk specifically about Johnson Deconstruct and what that means. So we've engaged them as a company to um, take down the buildings piece by piece and to donate uh, most of the interior fixtures and um, railings, flooring, tiles, things like that to Habitat for Humanity. And um, they're gonna do that for all three buildings. They will not do it for the chiropractor building because there's uh, nothing really historical or of any historic nature there. And one building they will take down completely to the studs and reuse the wood for um, another house that they, that they plan on building. And also um, the tenants, how many tenants live in these three buildings right now? Is there 25 or 30, was it? There's there's 21 available units, but how many people are living here right now? Okay. Seven, 17 units are, are occupied. The tenants that are currently living there now, are you guys helping them find other available living quarters for yes. them? Yes, yep, we, we've there? sent them uh, letters letting them know what's going on, and we've also uh, have given them at least six addresses that are within one mile radius to be able to move from this into the new one without any change in their deposit status. Okay, and lastly, you had indicated in the original plans that you guys changed a little bit to today, that there's still 10 of these that are still affordable units, is that correct? Yes. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. No further lights, is there a motion on item C? I make a motion to accept item C. Motion a second, roll call. Rowe? Yes. Begley? Aye. Harding? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Melton? Yes. Palermo? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. Motion passed 7 to 0. As amended? Uh, make a motion for as amended. Roll call. Rowe? Yes. Begley? Aye. Harding? Yes. Johnson? Yes. Melton? Yes. Palermo? Yes. Mr. President? Yes. Motion passed 7 to 0. Item 13, to consider a Class I liquor license for La Sierra, located at 1702 South 10th Street, A's Communications and Support, B's Communication in Opposition. Item number 13 was postponed from our February 15th meeting. The public hearing and vote is today. Proponents, please. Hello. Uh, my name is Brenda Casares. I am uh, representing La Sierra, which is at address 1702 South 10th Street, Omaha, Nebraska, 68108. Thank you. Here to answer questions? Um, yes, here to okay. answer questions, please. Any other proponents on number 13? Seeing none, any opponents? My name is Mary Thompson. I live at 1309 South 6th Street. And my position with this situation is that I'm president of the name of Neighborhood Association, which is Dolman. And uh, uh, there's some, on the application for the Class 1i liquor license, I have a few remarks on this issue. At the first hearing, the owners were advised to contact me as president of the Neighborhood Association. Councilman Bagley at called me and asked if I would visit with them, and I said yes, I could do that. I received a call from a woman named Brenda, I think that's who she said she was, and could I visit with her about the subject. I was with clients in my office in Millard, I am a tax accountant, and told her I was busy and could she call back or could I get back to her later. About 30 minutes later, she called again and I was still with clients, and could not talk. She proceeded to tell me that she was going to tell him, and I'm not sure who that is, that I would not talk to her. This is not the case. I would have been happy to visit with her about the proposal for a liquor license, but she decided that she did not want to talk to me after all, and made a very serious point of telling me that was what was she was going to tell him. Therefore, since they implied that they were not members of the Dolma Neighborhood Association, this is not true. We have a small membership fee of $9 a year, and there was nothing paid under that name. Another thing that really concerns me 
is that they claim that the food they are serving is handmade or homemade. How is this possible when they don't even have a kitchen? I have my doubts that they are willing to make the leasehold improvements to accommodate bar service and cocktail to go privilege and tap beer, which seems to be the thing that was the most asked for on the comments. They could use throwaways and we could now have more trash on the street along with the plastic bags and face masks. When they applied for their liquor license, they checked the box that they did not want to uh, have uh, cocktail to go privilege. They changed that and said they wanted cocktail to go privilege. We really don't need any more liquor spilling across 10th Street. Other places have made it without selling booze, wine, or, and working, and having worked in a bar for about 20 years, I'm not sure if they really realize what selling beer, wine, and distilled spirits would do for the business as it sits today. If your food is as good as people say it is, they will keep coming even if you don't sell liquor. When they posted on uh, Facebook uh, in January, if the sale is, is to start selling liquor in the near future, what liquor, beer, drinks would you like to see? There were 17 comments, and six people said they wanted either tequila or Mexican beer. I can eat Mexican food without drinking a beer or tequila, but that's just me. So. At this point in time, I really don't see that they need to have a liquor license. Many years ago, there were only a few, so many liquor licenses available, and if you wanted to sell booze, you had to buy someone else's license or show a really, really good reason that you should have one. Maybe we should rethink this policy. Thank you. Thank you. Any other opponents today? Seeing none, public hearings closed. Mr. Bagel, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. Brenda, can you come up, please? Sure Good can. afternoon. Of course. Thank you for coming back and your patience. Um, when we left off a couple weeks ago, when we got this laid over, I'll just kind of go review things with you. So you're asking to have this liquor license from 11.30 a.m. to 8 p.m., correct? Um, yes, our application um, stated that we wanted, actually the application asks you to provide the hours of operation of your business, and yes, those are our hours. Okay, and, and if you, in the future, if you wanted to make that go beyond 8 p.m., I would like to at least have you on record that you would come back to the city law committee to do that. Is that something you would be willing to do? Sure. Is that a requirement? It's a request that I'm making. Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, I got a question for Mr. Fanslaw. Dave Fanzla, City Planning. Dave, can you confirm all the permits that were required for this building have been met with, can you walk through what those permits would be that they met all those? That, that's a good question. I don't know if I have a list of the required permits um, that would be needed, but I can tell you before they can open the doors, they'll have to pass all inspections that my department handles. Okay, and I know I'm talking to staff, I'm, I'm confident that the answer is that Brennan's folks have passed all those permit requirements before you got here today. Yes, um, in fact, when you open a business, as um, he stated, you are required to pass all of those inspections, and when you apply for the liquor license, you get re-inspected. So um, we had a total of, I think, maybe five, uh, five or six different inspectors, and we all passed successfully. Yep, and in speaking to the landlord, uh, Mr. Zebarth, I believe it's pronounced. Yes. Um, you, you guys will be able to park across the street. So you're at 1702 South 10th, right? Correct. You, under the lease you have from Mr. Zebart, I think I'm pronouncing Alan Zebarth, correct. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Alan, you, you, your um, patrons can park across the street in the parking lot there, right? Exactly. Um, that uh, parking lot is actually part of our lease agreement, and we have non exclusive rights to it. Non exclusive meaning um, he has a use of the building upstairs so if he wanted to intend to use the parking as well then we we would share that with him or with anybody that he would say hey i have a business right next to to ours if if i wanted those tenants to also uh, be willing to use that it would be us and whoever he rents the next building to okay and i know a couple of weeks ago we talked about of course we want you to succeed and we wish you the best of luck i do and i'm sure my colleagues do as well um and i know you opened during COVID times which is tough the worst but time. in being out in Omaha the last few weeks, like people recently, especially, it looks like we're getting beyond that. Yeah. So I, I think 
it's a good time now that you're starting and, and you know I, I'm gonna um, vote to approve the liquor license and and I I'm glad that you're committed that if you wanted to go past 8 o'clock that you will do that in writing to our law committee in the future if you wanted to do that sure and I know also that you you'll take pride in the neighborhood like the other businesses and neighbors do down there um, to make sure things are clean and of course you want it clean because you want people coming back Yes, um, actually, I know that Mr. Zebarth had a conversation with you today. I know that he mentioned to you that we are one of his best, if not the best tenants that he's had because we are very clean, um, not only our restaurant, but outside as well. Uh, we don't make full use of the parking lot just yet since our business is barely picking up because of COVID. So, um, but we do already go out there, make sure that there's any you know, beer cans, anything like that, anything uh, our customers would have dropped or, or thrown away, we have been already taking care of that. Okay, and I know Mary, I, you don't have to come down, Mary, but I, I appreciate your comments and the work you do for Dolman for many years in our city. Um, I, I don't take lightly listening to a neighborhood association, but as we sit up here, we balance small business owners, neighbors' concerns, and I, I, I don't, maybe I gotta do a better job of it, but I, I try to broker at least people communicating and talking and I, I encourage everybody to do that going forward from today. And I, I know you will. I, I sincerely believe that you and your folks will do that. And I also told you that I would come down and have lunch or dinner down there, and I look forward to, to doing that. But I just make sure you're cognizant, as I know you will be, to the neighbors' concerns. It, it's a great pocket down there. It, it's got a lot of history. Mm -hmm. And I think your family going in there and the liquor license, it, it'll, it'll help your business. And you'll wanna be good members of the community like everybody else and we're all rooting for you. So thank you, I, I really appreciate, appreciate that. I appreciate your patience in coming down again today. Yes. Thank um, you. I did um, go ahead and take your, um, your, your comments or your suggestions to go ahead and reach out to the community members. So I did try to reach out to Ms. Thompson as she stated, we were not able to, to communicate um, for um, a couple of reasons, but um, I did want to call out a couple of things too. Um, I know there were several emails that were sent to you in support. I know that we haven't really touched base on those, but um, and I don't, I'm not sure that they were sent to the city clerk. Um, but I did want to just stress that I have reached out to the community. We have, um, you know, asked for more uh, feedback, and we said, hey, if you are for or if you are against, please do us a favor. Please voice voice your opinion. Please send your emails, your calls, anything to both uh, Mr. Bagley or um, Ms. Butler. So um, could you just touch base if you did receive those emails? I, I would be glad to comment on that. Okay. And the answer would be affirmative. Yes, I did. And I spoke to Ms. Butler this morning and last night when I got your text message. Yes. And all those letters have been received and in the record. So Perfect. you did a good job of organizing people in the community to let them know what they thought about your restaurant. So. I absolutely did get all those emails, and I, if I didn't reply back to one of them, that's on me, but I tried to respond to every one of them yes, to have. acknowledge that I got them. So yes, thank you for, for asking that. Okay, perfect, thank you so much. Thank you, is that a motion? That is a motion to approve the liquor license number 13. Second. Motion and a second to approve, no further lights. Roll call. Roe. Yes. Bagley. Aye. Harding. Yes. Johnson. Yes. Melton. Yes. Palermo. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Item 13 is approved 7 to 0. Thank you. Item 14 to consider a Class I liquor license for Jasmine Lillian Studios located at 4879 South 132nd Avenue. Public hearing and vote on number 14 is today. We have the applicant by Zoom, Jasmine Buller. I think you're off mute now if you want to give your name and address. Hi, uh, my name is Jasmine Buller. I live at 13704 Lillian Street, Omaha, Nebraska. Um, and I am the owner of Art by Jasmine Lillian LLC, and I will be leasing the building at 4879 South 132nd Avenue, Omaha, Nebraska, 68137. Great. You're going to answer questions, right? Yes, absolutely. All right. Any other proponents here today? Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearings closed. Mr. Rill, you're recognized. Uh, Mr. President, I'd like to give uh, Jasmine a, just a moment to uh, do a little infomercial, if she would. Uh, tell us a little bit about your uh, business and uh, what your intentions are there. Okay, absolutely. So it's going to be a gallery space and also a studio space. 
And part of that studio space is going to be used for like a paint and sip style class. Um, but it's also going to be used for artist workshops. Um, I intend on having one-on-one -on -one lessons for kids and tutoring and stuff like that. And just having gallery shows as well. Okay. I'd like to move for approval, please. Second. Motion and a second. Roll call. Roe, Bigley, Aye. Harding, Johnson, yes. Melton, yes. Palermo. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. M14 is approved, seven to zero. Thanks. Items 15 and 16 can be considered together for Class I liquor licenses for Scissors and Scotch, located at 6750 Mercy Road, Suite 3, and 2835 South 170th Plaza, Suite 212. Public hearing and vote on numbers 15 and 16 are today. We also have the applicant by Zoom, Dylan Pizzoza. Get you off mute here in a second. Okay. All right. Hi, my, name is, my name is Dylan Pachasa. I live at 18315 Grant Street, Elkhorn, Nebraska, 68022. And I am the current new owner of both of the Scissors and Scotch locations in Omaha, Nebraska. Great. Thank you. Any other proponents today? Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearings closed. Motion and a second. Roll call. Rowe, Bigley, Harding, Johnson, yes. Melton, yes. Palermo. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed seven to zero. Thank you. Item 17 to consider a Class K liquor license for Mercury located at 329 South 16th Street, Suite 3. Public hearing and vote on number 17 is today. We have the applicant by Zoom, Clark Ross. Hello. Hi there, name and address please. Uh, my name is Clark Ross. My address is 2131 South 34th Street. Uh, I am the owner of Mercury on 329 South 16th Street, unit number three. I'm here to just uh, address any comments or questions you Great. may have. Thank you. Any other proponents today? Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearings closed. I move that we uh, approve this liquor license. Motion and a second. Roll call. Rowe, yes. Bagley, Aye. Harding, yes. Johnson, yes. Melton, yes. Palermo, yes. Mr. President. Yes. Item 17 is approved, seven to zero. Thank you. Item 18 to consider a liquor license addition application for Bob and Willie's Bowl located at 3724 Farnham Street to add an outdoor area is communication from the planning department regarding a permit for the outdoor area. Public hearing and vote on number 18 is today. Proponents please, Mr. Kelly. Good afternoon, Mr. President, members of the council, Sean Kelly, 2804 South 87th Avenue, appearing on behalf of the applicant. This afternoon, uh, I would just note that uh, the requirement from the planning department is acceptable. Great, thank you. Any other proponents today? Seeing none, oh, go ahead. Luis Jimenez, 2709 Dewey Avenue. Uh, Councilors, please approve. Um, the outdoor area, if you're familiar with it, has gone through a lot of construction over, I think it was the, the fall, summer and fall last year. And the property and building has been laid out so you can have a food truck, a uh, outdoor area, and then the mini bowling inside the building. It's really exciting. And I just wanted to be uh, in support because um, I spent a lot of time in this area of town. Thank you. Thank you. Any other proponents today? Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearings closed. Mr. Begley, you're recognized. Very briefly, I wanted to thank Luis for your comments. Uh, I miss you at Cheeseburgers last week when I was there, but you're kind of my subject matter expert for Blackstone, so I appreciate your comments today. Thanks, buddy. Thank you. Is there a subject to permits? Yes, sir. Motion and a second. Roll call. Roe, yes. Bigley, Aye. Harding, Johnson, yes. Melton, yes. Palermo. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed seven to zero. Thank you. Thanks. 
consent agenda, any member of the city council may cause any item placed on the consent agenda to be removed. Items removed from the consent agenda shall be taken up by the city council immediately following the consent agenda in the order in which they were removed unless otherwise provided by the city council rules of order. The public hearing on agenda items number 19 and 20 were held on February 15th. Roll call. Rowe, yes. Bagley, Aye. Harding, yes. Johnson, yes. Melton, yes. Palermo. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed seven to zero. Public hearings on agenda items number 21 through 51 are today. If you wish to address the city council regarding these items, please come to the microphone, indicate the agenda item number you wish to address, identify yourself by name, address, who you represent, and if you are a proponent or an opponent. Seeing none, public hearings closed. Oh, <laughs> gotcha. Public hearings closed. Is there a motion? Motion to approve and a second. Roll call. Rowe, Bagley, Aye. Harding, yes. Johnson, yes. Melton, yes. Palermo. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed seven to zero. Item 52, an ordinance to approve the contract with DPS LLC for the transportation of Sludge Cake Biosolids, Missouri River Water Resource Recovery Facility and Papillion Creek WRRF project at an estimated annual cost of $1,883,700. Public hearing on number 52 is today. Proponents, please. Uh, Jim Tyler, City of Omaha Public Works. I'm here with Jim Key, also of Public Works. We're here to answer any questions that the council may have. Um, this, this contract's for the hauling of sludge biosolids. It's a beneficial use material byproduct of our wastewater treatment facilities, and it's uh, necessary to have this in place. It would cost us millions of dollars if we had to take this to a landfill. We haul it to farmers who use it as fertilizer and it saves millions of dollars for the city of Omaha. Um, I would like to mention that uh, we are aware of a letter that was provided to the city clerk this morning and we've had the opportunity to look at that. We'd like a little more time to look at that and we will uh, review that with our law department and provide an answer to council on a response to that letter prior to your vote next week. Uh, we have also submitted a letter prior to you on January 28th, 2022 um, in response to previous communications um, from the owner of Blade Masters um, in response to those previous communications he had with you. And I asked Mr. Dowding to uh, reshare that letter with you. So uh, we're just here to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, thank you. Any other proponents today? Seeing none, any opponents? Senator Wayne, welcome. You haven't had enough of public hearings so far, huh? <laughs> yes, I'm not. <laughs> Justin Wayne, uh, W-A-Y-N-E, 8937 North 56th Avenue, Circle, Omaha, Nebraska. I am not here in my senator hat, nor am I here to talk about TIF, so well, we're, <laughs> we're doing better today. Uh, all of you guys were provided a letter uh, which was referenced. I won't read the letter, but I just want to say from a public policy standpoint, typically if there's a, a bid that is out there and there's only one bidder received, it should raise questions on to how that bid was crafted because the purpose of not only your code, your municipal code, but state statute is to require a competitive bid process. And if there's only one that was received and one deemed ineligible, you should really question whether that bid was done right. In this particular case, the specifications for the trailer was actually stopped being made by the manufacturer out of Canada with the sales group out of Dallas over three years ago. Your current contractor is the only one who has those types of trailers and this is written directly for that contractor. Uh, that flies in the face of stat state statute and also city ordinance to make sure that we have a competitive bid process. I noticed that it was interesting that the letter was provided and he said prior to the vote, so next week, I would suggest that the council lay this over for the entire week to make sure that you guys can look at this, you all can look at this to make sure that the bid was actually done to be open and competitive. To put that in perspective, other cities, other states who have similar programs use things as simple as a dump truck that covers over the top to make sure nothing comes out. This is a very detailed, specified uh, trailer that was attached to this bid that only, the only person who has that is the current contractor. Don't worry about costing the city money or anything else, like or stopping operations. The current contractor has been operating for the last two months on an extension of their current contract. Delaying this by one week or looking into this or even sending it back out to bid won't cause any operation disruption for the city of Omaha. But I do think if you're that specific on a contract, it raises an eyebrow and doesn't pass the smell test. Thank you. Thank you. Any other opponents today? 
seeing none, I'll close public hearing. Uh, Mr. Tyler, um, the letter you're anticipating to get to council, when would you anticipate that's available to us and to others with concern? Uh, Jim Tyler, City of Omaha Public Works. I'm, I'm thinking that, you know, I've, I've already started to look at the letter. I've started to prepare uh, responses. I would like to sit down and look at those with uh, Bernard in, in the Bosch Law Department. I'm thinking within a matter of a day or two. Okay. Um, I wanted to make sure we had a common expectation about when we might receive that information and note that there would be no vote until at least March 8th. And should we not have that information, we would have the opportunity at that point to lay over further if needed for this for this discussion. Yeah, yeah ab absolutely. And like I said, I, I, I see no reason where a day or two absolutely by the end of the week. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Johnson, you're recognized. I was just going to make a motion that we move um, to lay this over for one week. Pardon me, I'm sorry. I move that. Thank you very much, appreciate that. I move that we keep this open. However, I do move that we look at this additionally, um, um, just as we were um, um, advised to, to look at the smell test. Um, that's why I'm asking that we lay this over an additional week. I know that we vote on this next week, but that gives us two weeks to look at the smell test. Okay, so there's a motion to lay over for two weeks. Just uh, one point of order though, um, the public hearing was closed, so the public hearing would not be continued, but that doesn't prevent folks from calling people up for further discussion, which would be, which was my intent in, in doing that. So just wanted to note that. But there is a motion at the moment to lay over for two weeks. Second. There's a motion and a second. Mr. Plamerall, you're recognized. Okay. Mr. Tyler, <clears throat> a couple questions for you. I know we're gonna have a couple weeks for questions, and I'm sure uh, we will send them all to you, but. I want to make clear uh, on what I read and what I'm hearing. So we're going to approve a contract for sludge hauling, but temporarily the previous contract is expired, right? The, the previous contract expired. Uh, we worked with our law department and the current provider um, to basically issue a change order for temporary measures to continue the hauling of the sludge until at such time this contract would be approved. Do we normally ask contractors to extend their contract for the same rate? We would typically, and I might ask Bernard to help me with a little bit about this, um, we, we typically would have to, if a contract's expired, um, depending on how that contract is written, we may um, we may or may not be able to get that same rate. So I'm, okay. I'm, I'm not gonna be able to answer that very well myself. The reason for my question is, um, we're hearing that we can delay this and the, the contract would be fulfilled, but in, in truth, maybe it will be, but not at the same rate. So that way, uh, our taxpayers will not be paying the same amount of money to continue. Yeah, so so we did not, and Jim T, you might have to help me out a little bit on this with the, with the contract. We were not able to keep the contract at the rate of the, the value at the previous rate. We had to work with the current provider to basically negotiate a rate until at such time we had a new contract. Um, tell me what happens if we don't haul this sludge. Tell me if there's not a contract in place. Is there a, a fine or a penalty that would be assessed to the city of Omaha? What we would do is we would take that to a landfill. Okay, that's the only legal disposal method of it. Our current landfill here in Douglas County won't accept it. When we had to haul it previously, we've had to haul it to Butler County at a very high cost. It, it will be millions of dollars if we have to haul that. So it's it's very highly regulated. Okay, when you say we, if there wasn't a contract in place and, and 
we have to haul this? Who would haul this sludge? We would have to find a hauler. Some, we would have to hire someone to haul the sludge. Instead of hauling it to a uh, farm field, we would have to find a hauler that was able to transport that material at this point to Butler County Landfill. Okay. And we anticipate finding this hauler would be uh, outside of the regular guidelines of the contract, which would deem it not the same price. Correct. Okay. That's that's what I wanted to make clear. Um, we do have somebody hauling it. Uh, certainly, we have plenty of time to ask questions and figure this out, but there is a chance it's not for the same price. So. Um, Is it true that there's only one person that can bid this with the specifications of the trailer so, that is required? In yes, the bid? So, so we disagree with that statement. We believe that statement's inaccurate. We did not specify an exact make and model of a trailer. We specified a type of a trailer or an equivalent. And I will make sure I have those answers clearly spelled out in the responses to the letter from Mr. Wayne. Um, but there are other manufacturers that make that type of trailer, and we know those are available. It's just that the one currently in use by DPS, that specific make and model, is no longer being produced. But as far as what we specified, there are other trailers on the market that meet the requirements of what we specifically called out or as equivalent. Okay, thank you. Yep. Uh, Well, we're going to have a lot of questions, sure. obviously, moving forward on this. Um, that's it for now. Okay. Mr. Harding, you're recognized. Thank you. I, I know there's a motion and a second, so I, that's the, what I'd like to address at this point. I mean, this, this is in, not even scheduled for a vote until next week. Um, I think our public works department has said that after receiving the letter this morning, they're already working on a response to it. I don't see any reason to... Uh, delay the process at this point. I mean, I, I, I'm going to vote not to lay this over for two weeks, but knowing that we have that option next week, um, that's certainly something that that we could take up at, at that point in time if the answers or, or explanations from the Public Works Department don't satisfy our questions. Thank you. Mr. Palermo, you're recognized. Yeah, uh, one more thing I thought about as well with comments that we heard is um, at the city, we don't always take the lowest and the best. We don't always take just the lowest. We don't always take just the best. Sometimes it's one of each. Uh, but I can think of numerous contracts across the board at the city where we've only had one provider supply a bid. Um, so this isn't a, a unique case in, in that matter where there was only one provider, correct? And that's, uh, there's been a number of contracts where we've awarded on single bids received. That's the nature of the uh, competitive business we're in. Um, we, I, I believe we anticipated up to three that we'd spoken to that were uh, contemplating bidding. And as you know, we received two bids that were given to us for consideration. So we believe that the competitive process worked well. Thank you. Mr. Harding, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. So one, one other thing I've um, kind of just realized, too, is that we, um, I think there are a couple council members who might not be in attendance on the 15th. I think you might be one of them, and Council Member Melton might be the other, um, which means um, that if, if, if there's not consensus by the 15th, and we don't meet on the 22nd, then this would be laid over, in essence, till the 29th. So again, I think, I think, uh, you know, which would, would be at cost to the taxpayer. So I think, again, I think if we can keep this on its normal track and have the public works work on their response, which I know they're already diligently doing, um, and, and we come to a decision next week that it's not been satisfactorily responded to, then I think we can take up a layover at that or a layover at that point. But again, I think I think to keep this on track at this point makes the most sense. 
Thank you, Ms. Mil Ms. Melton, you're recognized. <clears throat> yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, there, there's no harm in having it come back up next week because we, we can vote it up or down next week. I'm not saying one way or the other, but there's no harm in keeping it on for next week and then continuing it if we don't have the answers we want. Or maybe we have the answers that we want and we're able to vote, vote it up or down, depending on what those answers are. What I would hate to do is cost the taxpayer more money just so that we can, d for deliberation time that we may or may not need. So I'm not in support of continuing it two weeks. Next week we can continue it if we feel the need to do so. Or vote it down, again, vote it up. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Johnson, you're recognized. Yeah, um, this question is for uh, Mr. Fanslow, I'm, I'm sorry, um, for the law department. If there is just cause found on the basis of this lawsuit, this potential lawsuit, how much money would the city lose? Mancusi City of Omaha Law Department, I'm not able to calculate that based on the hypothetical in Mr. Wayne's letter. So when we're talking, when we're analyzing uh, possibility of money being lost by the city, should we not consider both? Both the lawsuit? The potential lawsuit as well as the potential loss of money um, that we're talking about in terms of expenses that would incur because we didn't make a decision uh, next week. Well, one is more of a defined loss in terms of the contract and what we would be paying to the to the current company, what we'd be paying, which is different from the current contract. That's more of a defined number. In terms of the lawsuit, I couldn't speculate about the costs associated with that because of the myriad of costs that go into a lawsuit. It's not just the damages, attorney's fees, depositions, things of that nature. So I couldn't est give you an estimate for how much a lawsuit, such as Mr. Wayne mentioned in his letter, would cost. So we as city council should, uh, in our decision, um, should consider uh, the possibility that there I if there is fault found, the cost of that um, lawsuit should be determined in our decision today, I would think. The council's free to consider whatever factors the council deems appropriate in making their decisions. Thank you. Mr. Rill, you're recognized. Uh, Jim, or Jim, I guess Jim Tyler, what is the premium that we're going to be paying based on uh, not having a contract? Uh, Jim Key, City of Omaha Public Works. When we initially didn't have a contract and we were able to negotiate with the current provider, um, basically a span contract, a bridge uh, to get to where we are today, um, prior to having that, the quote was in the millions because they were basically asking, you know, this contractor has staff. You know, they need to know if they're gonna, that staff's going to continue to work beyond a month. And so he's tr they were trying to make sure that uh, they had their financials in order uh, for equipment, fuel. So it, it, it was quite a sum. It was, it was almost the, a year's worth of the work for two to three months. We weren't in a very favorable position. Thank you. Mr. Palermo, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. President. And yeah, either one, either one I got a question as well. So I was just sitting here trying to think of how to say this. So um, it's a contract that's being awarded uh, that the, the deadline's already passed, meaning you know we hired FCC, and on day one, we expected them to have the trucks in operation, picking up trash, uh, ready to serve our city. And in this particular bid, um, it seems as though uh, the lowest bid did not have the equipment ready on day one to take over. So I, I assume that's why they were deemed with a non-responsive bid? The, they were deemed non-responsive in their bid because we asked for a demonstration of the equipment for the trailer that they were submitting, okay? The demonstration in front of staff 
they did not demonstrate that the trailer could empty all of the material in the, uh, in the trailer. The, the material remained in the trailer. It was caught on the chain. It was not able to empty all the material like the current trailers we use. Okay. So as part of that demonstration, because it was deemed that it failed, okay, we sent a rejection letter. Okay. He then appealed, but the appeal was after the time that he needed to appeal within. Okay, so, so we rejected based on our assessment that it did not meet the intent of the contract. Okay, so uh, both bids, we know both of these contractors. Uh, they bid a lot of city work. I know we approve a lot of bids for both of them. I just, I'm trying to wrap my head around because I'm getting memos that are well past the January 1st deadline of when the contract expired and the new bidder had to be in place. And I'm, I'm just trying to understand how we would hire a bidder that didn't have the equipment to do the work. Um, I, ju I just don't see that happen. Would you agree? I uh, agree. Okay. So uh, I'll have a lot more questions, but okay. hopefully we'll have a couple weeks to figure them out. Thank you. Okay. There's no further lights. There is a motion and a second to labor for two weeks. Roll call. Ro. Bigley, Aye. Harding, no. Johnson, yes. Melton, no. Palermo, no. Mr. President. Yes. Motion failed three to four. Item 53, an ordinance to approve an agreement with Douglas County in the amount of $197,747 and to authorize funding from the City of Omaha's fiscal year 2021 Edward Byrne Memorial Justice Assistance Grant Program. Public hearing on number 53 is today. Proponents, please. Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearings closed. Item 54, an ordinance to amend various sections of Chapter 30 and to add new sections 30-38 and 30-39 of the Omaha Municipal Code regarding catalytic converters. Public hearing on number 54 is today. Proponents, please. Good afternoon, Council. I am Lieutenant Stefan with the Omaha Police Department, 505 South 15th Street, and I am here to answer any questions in regards to the proposed amendments to the ordinance. Thank you. Any other proponents today? Seeing none, any opponents? Public hearing is closed. Mr. Palermo. Yeah, thank you, Mr. President. Um, so I'm going to back up a little bit. Obviously, this is a proposed amendment change uh, from something we've heard loud and clear about here on the council uh, within the city, especially with the uptick we're, we're currently seeing. Uh, but I want to back up to tell people what a catalytic converter is because I heard it twice today that they said, well, we really like this, but what is it? Um, it's a emission control that uh, converts toxic gases uh, basically to make the world a better place. Um, that sums it up really good, I'm sure, for a public hearing. Uh, it's along the muffler, and if you didn't have this device, I'm sure uh, you and your neighbors a block away would also hear it. Um, so that's what it does. So there's a, there's a downfall to the catalytic converter, a couple of them actually. Uh, one of them is theft because it's actually external. It's on the outside of your vehicle, which makes it very uh, easily obtained by illegal activity. Um, you can pick up uh, these tools very easily anywhere uh, to cut these devices off. Um, and the other part of it too is because of the price of the precious metals that are inside these catalytic converters. That's why uh, people are stealing them, to be honest. I mean, thieves are stealing them to make money. Um, we heard in pre-council about the uh, amount that the thefts were up and it was off the board on what it had been in the past. And, and the values of these metals, um, from looking it up, um, the rhodium part of it per ounce was like $25,000 unless it's changed since I last seen it. So think about that. Why do you think people are stealing them? They're making a lot of money. We also heard in pre-council we're uh, tracking people and and figuring out how much was being made. Some of these individuals were making six figures a year uh, by property crime theft. 
keep in mind this is property crime theft that is crippling to the person that wakes up in the morning and goes out and starts their vehicle and it keeps them from going to work or going to the store to feed their family. Or that money that they were going to use to feed their family now has to go into a car park that nobody ever expected. So we get to this point where we're at now, and it's been quite a long journey with when we first heard about it and we were first asked, hey, please do something about it. You know, Michelle Peters in the law department was uh, instrumental. Obviously, the police department, you and your staff within that department. Uh, you never gave up. You keep making changes. You kept making changes to the, the ordinance that we tweaked to fit Omaha. Um, obviously, we didn't invent the wheel, but we took an outline and we tweaked it to fit the size of our city. But it also gave you um, the opportunity to, to help curb some of this by implementing some small changes within this ordinance. Uh, it's not going to stop thefts from happening, but it's going to give the police department some teeth that they desperately need to, to take the next step for these individuals that they know they've pulled over a vehicle and they see the tools and they see the catalytic converters and, and they're not in this business uh, to know that, hey, this is illegal activity and, and now we're going to make you produce this permit uh, and have some teeth actually stop some of it. There's another part of this too, which I haven't mentioned until now, is that, um, well, we know tomorrow uh, they'll be discussing this bill down in Lincoln to hopefully make it statewide. But I wasn't okay just with relying on Lincoln to make this happen. So I, I know I'm happy all of us, the law department, police department, myself, my colleagues have pressed forward to even though what happens in Lincoln, we're gonna do something here because we're hearing about it loud and clear. Um, but the other part is when people steal these catalytic converters and hopefully they're getting the message and now they're worried, they're, they're driving 10 and two to make it uh, to the eastern part of our city to Iowa where a large amount of them are uh, being taken to the, the salvage yard that here's where we do our job as council members. We have a lot of uh, contacts and meetings and communication with our partners east of the river. Uh, it has to do with uh, public work projects, uh, the planning department, the law department. I know. Uh, the president sits on the MAPA board. I mean, these are all uh, leadership individuals that we sit on boards with in the community that we're going to say, hey, you, you want our help? You want your city to be better? We want our city to be better? We got to work on stuff together. And, and one of them is uh, that decreasing quality of life when somebody has to wake up and realize their catalytic converter is gone. So the second part I'm going to continue to work on by putting pressure uh, on our colleagues uh, to the east and another state, Iowa, to, to hopefully follow suit and help us along with this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bagley. You're recognized. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, Lieutenant, a couple quick questions. I got your rank right, didn't I? Yes. Okay. Can you, for the people out listening today, you gave some statistics that were pretty sobering in our pre-council this morning. From 2016 to 2019, what was the average catalytic converter theft for those three years? The average for those three years was 55 per year. Okay. And let's fast forward to what the average is per month now. In the first two months of this year, we're averaging 155 per month. Uh, looking at the totals that we had from 2021, we had 1,368 catalytic converters stolen. It's an approximate 2,000% increase since over the 2016 to 2019 average. Thanks. I know in talking to, as Councilman Palermo said, we hear from our constituents from the Omaha Police Department, and the bill we have down in Lincoln is a good start, but I, I want to commend Councilman Palermo and Michelle Peters and the Law Department for the work they put into this because we all are hearing, and it's, it's increasing, I know you guys know that at the Omaha Police Department, and watching different neighborhoods on Facebook where they have recordings of thieves going up and is it 40 seconds they can double cut these things and they're gone is that it's less than a minute right yeah most of them are done in under a minute we'll keep working on this I, I know again my colleagues up here and I we hear from our constituents it's not confined to any particular part of town and if there's other tools that we can put in law enforcement's toolbox to curtail and prosecute these criminals I think, again, the work that's being done, and, and as, as Councilman Palermo mentioned, 
to work with um, our partners on the east side of the river and Council Bluffs and elsewhere, it, it doesn't stop at the river, right? I mean, the, this this thing is going on everywhere. So I, I'm glad that this is is on our agenda here, and we'll have more discussion on it. But I'm I'm hoping in Lincoln that we get some teeth at the state level, and then we can sharpen those teeth up at the city level here to really curtail this and put it out to our neighborhood folks that we hear you. We're, we're trying if we can do whatever we can. And I think this is a great additional step that is being made towards that. So thanks for the work you did on this. And thanks, Michelle, for the work you did earlier, too. Thanks. Thank you. I agree with those comments, too. I just wanted to add a few things as well. I, I thank uh, you, Lieutenant, for working on this and Councilman Palermo for your work on it and bringing it to us. Um, and a little bit of history, too, in terms of um, what this is doing in terms of adding to what we accomplished in 2016, I believe it was, with Leeds Online, adopting that first property crime ordinance of any uh, locality um, in, our, in our area, and I think in the state, uh, that has been very successful in addressing these kind of issues uh, previously with salvage dealers and secondhand dealers, and in this category of things, what we call precious metals. But this has always been difficult to address, this particular item, catalytic converters, and so, what this ordinance proposes to do is add that category of what's called a regulated metal property to that leads online um, uh, prospect. And uh, for those that, that are watching, what that, ha what that does is if you're a salvage or a secondhand dealer, you have, you've had to adopt basic point of sale technology, which does adopt fingerprints and little camera shots of property um, that is typically are, are, are frequently seen as being stolen by the police department just to make sure those items, in fact, aren't stolen uh, when those transactions make place and there isn't a quick exchange for cash like is the case with, I think, frequently with catalytic converters. And that has been very successful. We've returned over $300,000 worth of stolen property per year, approximately, since that time. So getting close to $1.5 million worth of stolen property returned to the rightful owners. Uh, much, um, much to do with your implementation of that product, so we appreciate the police department's efforts with that, both with Sergeant Jenham and now yourself um, taking over her, her mantle here. Um, one question I had about the state law also, which I think is, is a good, also a good addition, but in fact, this, this ordinance is better, I think, than what's being proposed in Lincoln. The, what's good about the Lincoln legislation, I think, is that it's obviously statewide, and you wouldn't have concerns like we do that this only applies to the city of Omaha, and therefore you aren't able to you know, control what happens next door in Carter Lake or even down the street or in a, in a surrounding city um, that might not handle this as well as we do. Um, the state law would only require folks to do the old system, I think, which is a fingerprint and probably a card system of some kind because they haven't adopted this technology. Is that your understanding, too, of, um, of LB-994? Yes, there's going to be a uh, part of that uh legislative bill is the record keeping aspect of it not every jurisdiction will have the technology of the leads online and like you said using a card and fingerprint some of that may be uh, manual implementation but there are some other aspects of the legislative bill that does uh, mirror some of the things that we did uh, one of those is requirements of the person selling a catalytic converter to have the vehicle identification number, work order, or something to show when they're making that sale where that catalytic converter came from. That would uh, give, uh, that take away the market drastically because the people that are out there stealing these catalytic converters, maybe four, five, six, seven in the night, they are not going to have a uh, vehicle identification number available to them. And even those other jurisdictions, if they're seeing multiple sales of those catalytic converters and that person uh, does provide a vehicle identification number in the sale while the uh, buyer of that product will not be able to confirm that all of those are legitimate vehicle identification numbers what that does is give law enforcement that vehicle identification number and we can backtrack give that person a call we have uh, the ability to look up the identification number of that vehicle, contact the owner and say, did you sell a catalytic converter? Did you have one taken off your vehicle? And he's like, no, everything is uh, uh, still intact. Well, now we can have a way to go speak with the person that uh, sold that catalytic converter. And like you said, as, as part of the legislative bill and uh, the city ordinance that does give us more tools than the state statute does, it gives us a way to 
uh, follow up and backtrack and hopefully put a significant dent in these thefts that, like you said, are significantly impacting the quality of life in Omaha and around the state. Great. Thank you. And Mr. Cousy, maybe a question for you. So that, I think that state bill, bill then, LB 994, is a positive thing. It just doesn't go as far as what we're proposing to do in our ordinance. But should the state law pass, uh, we can still pass this ordinance and still put this enhanced effort in place, can't we? Matt Cousy, Law Department, I don't see any issue why both both is both the ordinance and the statute couldn't exist. Great, thank you. So I appreciate that. I think Councilmember Palermo intends to go down and testify tomorrow on that as well, which I, th I think is good since that's part of the city of Omaha's legislative package, and I see it as complementary to what we'll are, we're going to vote on here next week. And then, um, can you just describe, describe the penalty too? What's the penalty in this ordinance? Should they be found in violation? The penalty will be a misdemeanor and uh, I refer to the, the law department for the extent of the uh, punishment that's available. But uh, a first offense type of deal with a low class misdemeanor, it's gonna be a uh, low penalty, but uh, we do have the ability if we see these people violation of the penalty uh, repeated amounts of times to uh, work with the city prosecutor's office to push for the uh, enhanced uh, penalty. Matt, do you want to expand upon that too? What's that? Matt, Matt Cousy, Law Department. The penalty would be up to six months in jail, a $500 fine, or both, um, as prescribed in 110 of the ordinances. Thank you. That's what I, I thought, and I think that is a deterrence, and I'm sure a deterrent from your perspective in terms of the seriousness of what we're experiencing right now. Absolutely. Good. Um, I was thinking I had one more question here, but I might have just lost it, so what I'll do is recognize Councilmember Bagley in the meantime. Thanks, Mr. President. I want to make the point that I lost so you can figure yours out. <laughs> you, you mentioned also this morning, Lieutenant, um, the make and model, there's some that are targeted more than others, but it, it was, you had mentioned, I believe, um, daycare vans. They have two converters on them. So if, if people out there listening today are asking what they can do besides call 911 when you see somebody trying to steal these things, you can also, was it LB 994, is that? Mm -hmm. Call your state senator and encourage him to support that, he or her to support that bill because it's tools that we can use to assist the men and women of the Omaha Police Department. And I know in talking to Councilman Palermo before our meeting here today on the depths of the bill or the, the ordinance that Michelle wrote up and how these things can connect and. It's not gonna solve the problem, but we're doing everything we can to address what we're hearing and what we're seeing and what, what you guys are seeing in the field as well. So I would encourage people again to call your state senator to support LB 994, but thanks again for the work you've done. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. And you bought me enough time to right. maybe remember my last question. <laughs> Also, how this will work, if you're a salvage dealer um, in this business, um, or let's say you know a car dealer or a mechanic, to come into compliance with what's being proposed here, which most of them want to do because they don't want to be selling stolen property either. That affects their business, and, and they want to be um, good stewards and be helpful to the, to the uh, issues you're experiencing as the police department. If you're a salvage dealer, you don't, there's nothing you need to do other than adopt uh, catalytic converters into your leads online system that you're already doing for other materials, right? And the majority of the salvage yards are already adopting, are, they are putting in the leads online the catalytic converters. Uh, one of the issues that we're having with them implementing the catalytic converters is they're calling them by multiple different names, but we are able to work with the system to uh, what we see the salvage yards generally using as names. They might call them a loaf or a torpedo or whatnot, but then we're able to reach out to leads online and funnel that uh, information to, uh, to our record keeping to be able to see that. This would uh, allow them or have them more precisely uh, record the catalytic converter sales to include one of the items items in the ordinance was per item so if they're selling that regulated metals property they're going to have to list each catalytic converter as opposed to say uh, 20 miscellaneous torpedoes we're going to have to get more detail from them and then 
they're going to have to take a copy of the permit that's going to be required by the city of Omaha as well. So it's going to be very minimal additional uh, documentation for the uh, scrap yards and second or salvage yards, but uh, it will give us uh, that valuable information that uh, we're currently lacking. And I know a challenge is sometimes they get they receive the metal not intact or not as a unit. Uh, can you describe what you see in that respect? Repeat. They don't always receive a catalytic converter intact, and so it's sometimes it can be hard for them to identify that that's what it is or what that metal might be. Mm. How might you address that? Uh, the vast majority of the ones that they're taking in are identifiable. The uh, they're not cutting them in half, so they're they're. I spoke about it this morning where they're double cutting the catalytic converters where we had some success in the past where we were matching up a specific vehicle, say a Dave Keir van, we're able to go to the scrap yard and grab that catalytic converter, put it underneath of the um, van and the cuts on the, each side were matching up. While well, we made three, four or five arrests for that, we're being able to backtrack those. Uh, the thieves quickly realized that uh, we were matching those up and they double cut those they cut the both sides. So uh, getting back to your question, the vast majority of the catalytic converters that do come in, they're identifiable as catalytic converters where uh, having the scrap yards uh, list each item because they know what they are. Uh, sometimes we do have a little bit of difficulty with uh, scrap yards uh, being 100% uh, uh, forthcoming with what they're buying, but with requiring them to uh, line item each catalytic converter it gives us uh, and then in conjunction with the vehicle identification number that is needed for that seller to now sell we'll be able to uh, backtrack those to a vehicle or uh, speak with the person that's uh, selling a vast amount and see what their story is and see if it matches up good and then if you're a car dealer or a me mechanic or you have some legitimate reason to be handling catalytic converters all you're doing is getting a permit from the chief of police, I believe, to show that that is in fact your occupation and why you're doing this, right? That is correct, and and uh, that uh, mechanic or place that's working on cars that would have a legitimate reason to have it, they're going to have those work orders with that vehicle identification number uh, readily available to them. So that is not who we're uh, targeting. We're not going after the uh, the people that are running a legitimate business, fixing cars that deal with mufflers and catalytic converters because they do have that byproduct, but it's the gives us some teeth and a way to backtrack and go after the people that we see on a continual basis, uh, continuing to steal over and over. An example that we had is we had a, we caught a, the same suspect three times in a bus lot uh, and the second time we caught him, it was away from a bus lot and we were just unable to line up we know where they're coming from, we know what they were, but we were not in quite close enough proximity to be able to go into the court of law and say we know for sure that these catalytic converters came from which specific bus. So that provides us uh, some difficulty with prosecution, but this ordinance that uh, Councilman Palermo and, and uh, Michelle Peters and everybody put together I think was uh, detailed, took a lot of those things into consideration and will provide us that uh, ability to uh, try to decrease the amount of thefts in Omaha. Great. Thank you. Thanks for your work on it. Madam Clerk. Non-action items, items 55 through 84, do not require public hearing or city council consideration at this meeting, but will be placed on a future agenda for public hearing and or vote. The reason for non-action is noted after the item on the agenda, as well as the date the item is expected to appear on agenda for consideration. Second, roll call. Rowe, Bagley, Aye. Harding, yes. Johnson, yes. Melton, yes. Palermo. Yes. Mr. President. Yes. Motion passed seven to zero. Meeting is adjourned at 348 p.m.